five, four, three. Yummy like a gummy bear. It's the internet, you're busy, let's do this for March 25th, 2024. For the next hour or so, let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Today, oh my god, we have a lot of news, including a potential delay for Grand Theft Auto, Larian not making Baldur's Gate 4, and Capcom responding to criticisms of Dragon's Dogma 2. That's just the start, though. But first, please join me in welcoming today's co-host, the Game Mess Mornings, it's Emma Fife, everybody. Emma, how are you doing? I'm great. You know, all things considered, it's a Monday morning and I am uh, awake-ish. It's early for me on the West Coast, but boy, oh boy, we got a lot of video game news to talk about, even though there might be no more video games for the rest of the year, possibly time. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, there's plenty to talk about. We'll, we'll see if there's going to be plenty to play starting in April, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I got plenty to catch up on, so really not complaining at all. I, I did I did get your message this morning saying you were ready to go, and that, I think it was like 6.30 your time. Do you, is that you in bed seeing you if you have to wake up, or is that like you going to the gym? Like, what's your morning routine? No, okay, so I uh, that is me waking up on Mondays to do this show. I work out on my lunch break on Mondays. Okay. Sometimes I do a, like, 6.30 or 7.30 a.m. workout, um, but... I don't have time to do that and then also make myself look somewhat presentable to be on camera to do the news. So lunch break workouts on Mondays. But um, yeah, I've been on the 630 beat. I, I think I went to three, two or three 630 classes last week. And it's hard to get up that early, yeah. but it feels so good when it's like 730 in the morning. And I'm like, man, I already yep. did a whole workout today. This is great. I've already accomplished something. Uh, and then I inevitably take a very uh, long nap in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah, uh, there was a period of time um, when I had very young children. They're, they're still young, yes. but when they were very young. Very, very young. Yeah. And I was working a full-time job, and they were home mm -hmm. with me all day, and uh, the wife went to went to, went to to school to teach. She was right, a teacher. Right, yeah, for work. And yeah. so for work, and so she was gone all day. And uh, I was like, man, no second of this day belongs to me. And it's like, I've made these decisions, that's fine. And I started like, you know what, maybe I can rearrange things a little bit. And that turned into eventually waking up for uh, about a, about an entire year at 4.30 a.m. every day. And then that, that I'm like, okay, we will get everything done for me for between 4.30 and when everyone wakes up, starting around 7. Uh, and then I was like, now at that point, it's like when if, if the rest of the day belongs to other people and I got to give them my time, I'm like com completely okay with that. That's fine yeah, at yeah. that point. That was the only yeah. way I could make that work. Now it's like... I could sprinkle in time throughout the day. It's a little bit right. easier, but uh, yeah, uh, that, I'm, like, I'm, gl I'm glad I was able to do that. I don't think I could ever do that again. <laughs> That's not, yeah. not really an option anymore. Um, and I did have, uh, I, I've told this story on voicemail dump truck when we were at PAX, but I should tell for the, the, the game mess mornings audience. Uh, I won a bet on my birthday. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. I uh, put in some money for the Super Bowl a while back, and I've been I didn't lose all the money. I'm like, oh, I'll bet all that on like that Mike Tyson Jake Paul fight. That'll be fun. But we were talking about it on my birthday or a little bit before, and we were like making some bets. And I uh, had made like a bet the night before of it's an 11 game parlay, and every game has to hit to win. And uh, as it was like the clock was clicking over to my birthday, I was like looking at it, and I put nine dollars in whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was looking, I'm like, oh my god, I. Uh, I'm everything's hit so far and these like last four, like two to four games are looking pretty good. And then for like the next hour, it's like one, they just kept hitting, kept hitting, kept hitting. I had to hand my phone over to Jeff Bacalar who kept saying stuff like you're definitely going to win. And I had to yell at him, not to jinx it and stuff. Um, and then, yep. I, I'm like, I, I walk away and I come back. He's like, do you know what happened? I'm like, no, he's like, you, nope. you won. And I'm like, Oh my, it was $10,000. Emma, I won ten thousand dollars on a nine dollar bet. You won ten thousand dollars. <laughs> the hour what? it became my birthday. The hour it became my birthday. Yeah. What? <laughs> it was uh, kind of the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. It was nuts. Oh my god! What are you gonna do with Pay that off credit money? card debt? Yeah, let's go. Yay! <laughs> That's being an adult. No, my yeah. my favorite thing though about that that Mike Tyson um, Jake Paul fight is that 
I saw this really funny meme where someone basically they took a screen cap of Mike Tyson versus Glass Joe in Punch Out and said <laughs> Nintendo's been warning us about this for years. <laughs> We're ready. God, I hope so. I hope that's exactly how it goes. Uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. People are like, oh, the taxes. They actually, uh, they, we, we were uh, the reason Backlar didn't come to tell me right away is because he was right. waiting to see the money go into the account. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like, it takes, it takes, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, uh, but I'm like, you know, I go to bed, get in bed like a couple hours later right. and it still had, it was still wasn't in there. And then I woke up the next Jeez. day and I got an email from them being like, we reviewed your big win and I'm a human being and I'm looking at this and he's like, it, it looks all cool. So I'm going to put it in your account. And then I looked and it was there, but they withheld the taxes for me. So oh, that's, that, good. Yeah. that's like really nice. So I'll get it. I'm going to get a 1099 from goddamn DraftKings at the end of the year, I guess. But Whatever, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, no, no complaints over here. Um, eh. But yeah, hey, the adult thing, yeah, I'm paying off the credit cards, but then I'll probably just go right back into debt when we go to Disneyland because that we are planning to try to do that this year, Disney World. So yeah, um, yeah, hey, whatever. It's worth it. That's great the whole place idea. to spend your money. Disney exactly. parks. <laughs> That's the yeah, yeah, they deserve it, right? They've earned it, uh, haven't they? <laughs> uh, all right, we should stop wasting time because we really do have so much news to get into. Let, first, let's explain ourselves. Most weekdays, I Jeff Grubb will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. For all these topics, I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you are watching live on Twitch, welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess with GTA 6 production is reportedly falling behind. Rockstar urges staff to return to office to avoid delay. This is from Zach Zweizen at Kotaku. Grand Theft Auto 6 is likely one of the most anticipated games in history, with millions of players around the world waiting for any scrap of info or screenshot of the upcoming open-world crime simulator. However, as remote workers struggle with an unwanted return-to-office mandate from Rockstar Games, Kotaku has, has learned from sources with knowledge of the game's development process that GTA 6 could miss its 2025 release window and slip into 2026. Officially un un unveiled in December 2023 after a massive 2022 leak, GTA 6 is the hotly anticipated follow-up to 2013's GTA 5. Over a decade after that game's release and its massive, still-growing sales numbers, Rockstar Games is hard at work on the sequel, which is set in Vice City, a fictional take on Miami, Florida. The game is set to come to PS5 and Xbox Series uh, sometimes in, sometime in 2025, and internally, that's still the plan. Kotaku was told by source, sources with knowledge of the situation that early 2025 is the current goal, uh, or is currently the goal. However, Kotaku has also learned that it's becoming more and more likely that the sequel might not land until late 2025. It's also possible that it could even slip into 2026 as production reportedly falls behind. Um, We'll get more into the uh, like remote work versus in office work here in a second. Uh, but just like starting there, I, it's GTA. Um, it, these games are massive. They are yes. also in a world where these games are are so much bigger than they ever were, and they have this changed dichotomy of we have GTA online, GTA online, which we need to continue supporting. We don't want to mess anything up there that continues to print money. Uh, GTA five continues to sell because of that. So we don't want to mess anything up there. Uh, and I think that gives them a little bit more uh, hesitation when it comes to GTA six. And I think that's leading into this as well. But if GTA 6 doesn't come out to 2026, that is not surprising to me. I don't know about you, Emma. What do you think? It's not surprising to me at all. I mean, here's the thing is that there's so much expectation attached to these games now that once you find yourself in a situation wherein you are a gigantic franchise like a GTA, you are basically in a, in an impossible situation at right all times and and a lot of that is again because there there is this expectation and this anticipation so you have people who are so excited to play this new game but and they're going to be frustrated by it taking a long long time however if you deliver something that is not up to expectations and in some ways it's impossible to meet expectations because the expectations are so astronomical at this point that i mean do yourself a favor and take the time that's i mean that's the way that i 
feel about it. The the other aspect of this, the return to work mandate notwithstanding. Right. And, uh, you know, I think this is um, I- I'm sure that Rockstar slash Take Two would love this to be, hey, you will be more productive if you come back to work. And that's why it's getting delayed. I think th- what the story gets at is is that there might be even some delays because of the disagreement, because some people yes. don't want to come back to the office. They are they have already made peace with being remote. And now a rock star wants them to return to the office for whatever reason. Maybe they do believe it'll make them more productive. But actually what's going to happen here is some people are going to be like, well, no, I, I, I'm not going to come back in the office, so I'm going to leave. And that itself could cause delays. Whatever. I, I mean, at this point, it's not like these games haven't been delayed when everyone was forced to come in the office and forced in so many ways to come in the office for 60 to 90 to 120 hours per week. Uh, you know, the, these these um, are the kinds of games where we know that people were sleeping out of the office previously and they were trying to get away from that. And, you know, it's not like people aren't going to crunch because they're working from home. That, that's still going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. This just seems to be the kind of thing where it's like another wrench in the works for a production that was already going to be massively complicated and and uh, and, uh, and really just challenging in a variety of ways uh, to get a GTA 6 made. It's already taken 10 years. Yeah, 10 years, like more than 10 mm-hmm. years at this point. And so the the idea that yes, it's going to take another years. yeah, a couple more <laughs> years. Yeah, I'm just not surprised by that. Um it comes back to though that hey they do have to follow up GTA GTA 5 they do have to make something that is a successor to Grand Theft Auto online and if if GTA 6 comes out and is in any way a spoiler to that or uh is uh, gets people more f- angry than excited uh they have a chance of having a game that's a, a dud and something that kind of pulls people away from GTA GTA online only to disappoint them and then maybe those people don't come back into GTA online so like they're right now they're playing with house money and they're afraid yeah. that maybe things could go wrong so i i think that's where that hesitation comes in where how yeah. do you make something that that makes sense after grand theft auto online Absolutely. And and that is such a good point as well. The the GTA online of it all. You don't want to be in a situation wherein you launch something that is a disappointment and then draws away long term from your thing that, you know, you've been supporting for a number of years and has been doing relatively well. Again, it's a an impossible situation to be in. So I think they just take the time that they need and keep supporting online in the meantime, and it'll happen. It'll it it's being worked on. Yep. And the the the, the, maybe not confusing thing, maybe the slightly surprising thing to me is that uh, Take Two was so cavalier with promising big big numbers for a game coming out in that next fiscal year, which would have been the fiscal year that we're going to be entering here in April for them. Uh, And they're Mm -hmm. like, it's going to be our biggest year ever by a like a margin of several billion dollars and that was always going to be yeah because because grand theft auto 5 is going to come out by the end of march 2025 and so mm-hmm. they could rely on that and then probably stuff like civiliz- civilization 7 could drop and those the combination of those two would help them like reach new heights um mm-hmm. now w- we know internally that they're already or not they, they've pretty much said it's not going to come till the earliest of spring 2025 and i know they're still saying that um but just to be like telling investors that this could be happening and then having to already tell investors, well, no, we are lowering our expectations because Grand Theft Auto V actually not going to come out in this fiscal year. I, 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 if I were them, I would just set expectations so much lower uh, because I, it does feel like that game could slip into late 2026. Like it's sure. that, it, that's possible, right? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And it, and it's, it's again that that sort of delicate balance between investors and also fans. And I want to say that the vast majority of the consumers, the fans, are because again at this point it's been over ten years since GTA Five. So who cares if it's another two years? Because once you get into this long of a time frame, years become a smaller percentage. Yeah. But there is also the aspect of Again, we were talking about fiscal years earlier or fiscal quarters, whatever. Yeah, so, and the fiscal. Woo, we're here, everybody. Woo. We did it. Yeah. Um, so uh, you also have those people to answer to. And that's, again, where you get into the complicated thing of forcing people to return to work and the crunch that happens around these games and how crunch is going to happen around this 
irrespective of whether or not they are in the office. Uh, so you might as well let people work in an environment where they feel focused and most capable. Um, yeah. Yep. It's I, just... I... <laughs> and I, I mean, I think we've seen several games now shift with uh, either mostly remote teams or entirely yeah. remote teams. I, I yep. If people want to continue uh, telling other people how they need to work because they want a video game real bad, I, I would suggest not doing that. That's that's unnecessary. Like you're 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 actually you're almost certainly wrong. You almost certainly don't understand what's actually going into getting these games made. And yes. if you want to mm -hmm. imagine a world in which oh, this game will come out faster if these people go into the office. I can't stop your imagination, but keep in no. mind, it's your own imagination. And you almost yeah. have, there's almost certainly no evidence that you have that proves that. So, and the games that are in front of us that, you know, um, Respawn shipped St Star Wars Jedi Survivor mm -hmm. uh, uh, enti almost entirely remotely. And yep. the, the op optimization, optimizations yep. aside, that game was really well put together. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on here. Uh, Larian says it's moving on from Baldur's Gate to make a new thing. This is from Tom Ivan at VGC. And this is a, a two-part headline here. Uh, Larian Studios CEO Sven Vinke has said the company's moving on from Baldur's Gate and the Dungeons & Dragons universe. Speaking at GDC via PC Gamer, the Baldur's Gate 3 director said the company has no plans, for to, no plans to make DLC expansions or a sequel to one of last year's best-selling and most critically acclaimed games. Instead, the Belgium indie developer and publisher, also known for its Divinity RPG series, wants to work on something new. We are a company of big ideas. We are not a company that's made to create DLCs or expansions. He tried that. We tried that actually a few times. It failed every single time. It's not our thing. Life is too short. Our, amb our ambitions are very large. And I think... Um, like two things here. One, I uh, I think that's perfectly fine. I don't. I'm not someone who ever feels like a game is not a real like not complete until we get an expansion, or um, that any great game would only be better if it did have an expansion. Nintendo said they're not going to do expansion for Tears of the Kingdom. That's completely fine right. with me. And the other thing, I'm glad a studio is not forcing them and, and tying themselves into a pretzel to make something like that if it's not coming out of them sort of naturally. Now, yeah, that's like a privilege. A lot of studios got to do what they have to do to make the money that they need to keep running. Larian yes. is maybe in a, a very unique position where they uh, clearly have made enough on this and are in a position of strength and they're acting on that position of strength and they should. They should have every right to do that. Oh, if you yeah. make a game that good, you should be able to do that, right? Exactly right. I, uh, again, Larian is in an unusual and extremely advantageous position wherein they made Baldur's Gate. So with Baldur's Gate, it's it's twofold. It's you have the Baldur's Gate of it all, which again, these games have been going on for a very long time. I remember playing like the OG Baldur's Gate on PC back when I was first getting into Dungeons and Dragons. And I know plenty of people that were into the Baldur's Gate games who weren't necessarily like tabletop Dungeons and Dragons people, but they enjoyed that world. They enjoyed those mechanics. They liked those games. And you also have the Dungeons and Dragons of it all. So you mm -hmm. have a bunch of people who are D&D &D players that are going to naturally be attracted to this. So you have this gigantic license and a legacy gaming title, and it was incredibly successful. Yeah. So Larian has proved that they can make a really damn good game. In some ways, it's not dissimilar from like a CD Projekt Red that did the Witcher games. And then, you know, obviously like Cyberpunk, again, you're you're dealing with something that was a pre-existing IP. There's the Cyberpunk, right. you know, tabletop role-playing games, but they're also in a position wherein it's like, cool, you made this game that people love that is a game of the year winning game. So you don't have to rely on IP anymore. Like you're in a great position now to take your sort of skeleton for these types of games and develop an IP that is completely original to you with having Baldur's Gate under your belt and having a whole new audience of people who didn't play the Divinity games coming in and saying, wow, I really love what Larian did with Baldur's Gate 3. I want to see what else they do, what they do next. Like it's Larian, I'm automatically going to play it. Yes, and I uh, I think that's that, that's where they are. Larian is yeah. the IP. Larian is the star, and they should take advantage of that. And, and there, I mean, there's part of me that's like, um, even as someone that didn't play a ton of Baldur's Gate three, I played some of it and enjoyed it. Uh, I played some of uh, the Divinity Original Sin two and really enjoyed that. 
Uh, mm-hmm. and, and it's like part of me is like I, I like when it, when they have to like work within this the confines of D and D something that I've also barely have experience with. But just part of me is like I like things that have this long history, and I look around and there's all these people that have strong feelings about it, and then that makes me want to look into it more and experience it, experience it myself. All those things aside. If they put out a new game, it's the new game completely from the ground up, original from the, the developers of Divinity Original Sin 2 and Baldur's Gate 3, people are going to show up. And I, 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 it's, at this point, it feels like the right move to get away from having to work with these other companies. In fact, let's let's get to the other headline here. Uh, Larian <laughs> CEO denies that moving on from Baldur's Gate was due to Wizards of the Coast conflict. This is from Chris Gulliam at VGC. Larian Studios CEO Sven Vinke says the decision to move on from the Baldur's Gate series had nothing to do with Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast is the owner of the Dungeons & Dragons IP, which which the Baldur's Gate series is based on. However, despite the enormous critical and commercial success of the latest entry, Baldur's Gate 3, Vinke has said last week that Larian was moving on from the Dungeons and Dragons universe to try its hand at something else. Vinke's comment led to speculation online, particularly on Reddit, where it was claimed that the decision was down to a falling out between Larian and Wizards of the Coast. To address this, Vinke, who also directed Baldur's Gate 3, has now taken to Twitter to dismiss those theories, saying there are no hard feelings and that Larian just wants to do something new. Uh, basically, this is the quote. Reading the Reddit threads, I would like to clear up some things. Uh, Wizards of the Coast is not to blame for us taking a different direction. On the contrary, they really did their best and have been a great licensor for us, letting us do our thing. This is because it's what's best for Larian. And I believe that. And also, they don't want to work with Wizards of the Coast. It's, I mean, come on. We, we, like, uh, yeah. um. we don't have to pretend <laughs> like we don't know what's going on here. Wizards of the Coast yes. is, is laying people off. Uh, probably people that Larian worked with closely. And now those people are gone. And now you got to deal with some schmuck that shows up to cash the checks that, of all the hard work that you did with those people. Come on. We know what's yeah. really happening here. Yeah. And at the same time. <laughs> Even if all that stuff did work out great, I bet Larian would be like, "Oh my God, look at where we're at. Yes. We should be betting on ourselves." And I bet that I bet that's number one on the bullet point. But come on, no one wants to work with Wizards of the Coast the way they oh, are right now. Absolutely not. And again, yeah. it's not necessarily that there was any particular disagreement uh, sure. with their licensor. Um, I, you know, I. But I, I look. It, did they directly? influence this happening not exactly but just by existing as they do now of course they don't want to work with wizards of the coast yep um you know and and again they're in a good position wherein they don't have to like they don't have to license anything to make a new video game focus on an original ip like we've had this conversation before and we were talking about it last week of like Every game, six million dollar budget or whatever. I, I mean, I was talking about films specifically, but I think you could do something very similar with games. But you know, where they are in that ideal position of they had an extremely successful game, and now instead of continuing to capitalize on the success of that game by directly making sequels to that game, they're doing something totally different, and that is what you want to see. Right. Yes, you you want. I, um, very few developers are in this position right now. Uh, everyone else is is kind of scrambling. So when someone was able to time it perfectly, which is uh, you can't time the market, so you just luck out. Larian released their game right as like funding's going out the window, and it's like, well, if anyone's going to be able to fund their game through through you know th- their own making of money or by partnering with people who are be like, well, we trust Larian, they are in a position to actually make that happen. So why again, why wouldn't they? They should, and um, and that that is that's going to set them up up for long term success when mm-hmm. they do make something new. And now this is their IP that they can continue to build out going forward. And then they, then they will be the licensor. They will be the one making uh, tabletop games based on the thing that they create. And they'll be making you know movies and TV shows and licensing stuff to Amazon and Netflix. And that's yep. where they are going to want to be in 10 years. So why right. not start now? And, and oh, the core of that will be an amazing new game that builds on what they've done with Divinity and Baldur's Gate 3. Yeah, and in a way that, that again, is investing in their own future as a studio and not yeah. in their licensor. Yep. And, you know, it, we'd be like, well, is this going to be Divinity Original Sin 3? Basically, th- there's a quote from from Sven where he says, we're going to move on. We're going to move away yeah. from D&D and we're going to start making a new thing. It does. It does sound like it probably won't be Divinity, which makes sense. Yeah. Right. Like, well, why not give people like you? I think you mentioned this. You were like a fresh entry point 
for people yes. who didn't spend a lot of time with Divinity, but did play Baldur's Gate 3. And now they're looking to spend more time with, with Larian, but maybe they don't have time to go back and invest in Divinity. And even if they do, the new thing will be even that more important to them, but it will still yeah. be this this entryway for a ton of new people, I think. So, yeah, yeah it's it's exciting. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Larian's kind of got right now feels like they have it all figured out. And I'm glad that they are. <laughs> making business mis, business decisions with confidence because i think that gives the people that are working there a lot of reason to stick around it's like why would you want to go somewhere else where it's like they're governed by fear uh, this won't last forever but if, if if larian is is operating with confidence right now that could filter down and create a much better working environment for everybody and i hope that's the case yep uh, all right, moving on. Capcom has responded to criticism of Dragon's Dogma two, Dogma Two's. Pay, I hate the, the possessive in the middle of the name. Yeah. Uh, the criticism <laughs> Dragon's of Dragon's Dogma Two's <laughs> paid DLC and performance issues. This is from Tom Ivan at VGC. Capcom has responded to Dragon Dragon Dogma Two. Oh my God! Once again, players who have criticized the game's use of microtransactions as well as performance issues on PC, while the game received glowing pre-release reviews, following today's launch, it has been a mixed reception on Steam, where just 40% of over 9,300 user reviews are positive. Players discovered on Friday that there are 21 separate DLC purchases available on day one. Disappointment appears to stem from the fact that some of them are for things that players feel should be easier to obtain in-game for free. Uh, players have also complained about performance issues and the inability to start a new game. In a message published on Steam, Cap Capcom said it has received numerous comments from the community on these subjects. To all those looking forward to this game, we sincerely apologize for any inconvenience. Um, they also went on to talk about uh, the performance issues where they said a large, a, a large amount of CPU usage is allocated to each character and calculating the impact of their physical presence in various areas. In certain situations where numerous, numerous characters appear simultaneously, the CPU usage can be very high and may affect the frame rate. We are aware that in such situations, settings uh, that reduce GPU load may currently have a limited effect. However, we are looking into ways to improve, to perform, or to improve performance in the future. Um, that's gonna be challenging, uh, it, the CPU limiting uh, what they can do with the simulation of each character yeah. in terms of physics. It's just gonna be, they're, they're only gonna be able to do so much and I don't want them to lose the magic of kind of the anything can happen nature of Dragon's Dogma because everything is being accounted for by the physics system. As yeah. for the microtransactions, this is, it's a weird one. Emma, I'm, I'm gonna start by saying people should be able to complain and criticize this stuff whenever they want uh some yes. people are pointing out that capcom has done this with a lot of their games resident evil um uh the the devil may cry uh, there's yeah. several games i think monster hunter had very similar things all from launch mm -hmm. or maybe maybe after uh, launch even and people were mostly quiet about those there was some complaining but not like it is here and to them like you know what you you're allowed to criticize whenever you notice something if you didn't notice mm -hmm. it with resident evil and you notice it here and it bothers you now People should be able to criticize because what companies are actually afraid of, they're not afraid of us coming on this show and talking about this stuff. They are afraid no. of people on social media getting a brouhaha going and everyone starting to complain because that's what really moves the needle. And it moved the needle for this game where it got negative yep. reception for the most part on Steam. So complain, criticize, but they have done this before. And while I, I appreciate the... Um, idea of when you start a game and you see these uh microtransactions it is a poisoning of the well it is something where it's like mm -hmm. you imagine in your head like did they craft this game in such a way to encourage me to use these things by most accounts it doesn't feel that way but you don't know no Maybe, you just don't know and when you go to start a game if that like is a something that a thought that occurs to you that is still a negative experience that you're having where you're like am i being manipulated to spend money and even if you don't even if you aren't just thinking that can ruin some of the experience. So again, I, people, they, I think people should be able to criticize. And at the same time, Emma, doesn't feel like that big of a deal to me. I don't know. No, I, well, I mean, I think you bring up a good point too about the social media frenzy around these things and the way yeah. that it can negatively impact people's experiences or at least negatively impact the way that the game is being received by the general public. And I, I think that some of it comes from just this kind of groupthink. Uh, yeah. And people are not going into it and making their own decision as far as how they personally feel about the microtransactions. They go with the court of public opinion, which is microtransactions bad, ruining experience of game. Now, 
there are plenty of games out there, and certainly Capcom, you know, falls under this kind of uh, umbrella, uh, wherein, yes, there are these microtransactions that are highly optional, and in a lot of cases, and they, you know, they're saying this with Dragon's Dogma 2 as well, that these things that can be obtained through microtransactions can also be obtained naturally through progression um, within the game or yeah, or as paid DLC, which again, I, I haven't played Dragon's Dogma 2, but I assume that there, you know, there's a lot of the times, you know, when these games release, they come with these kind of like DLC packages that you basically can buy. Like I remember buying like the DLC pack for a Fire Emblem game or something like that, mm -hmm. where it's like you just automatically get all of the DLC as it comes out. So, yeah, but again, it's like I uh, as soon as you put the possibility of a microtransaction in your game, you are playing with fire. Right. Yeah. You don't the, the, the <laughs> um, you know, the presumption of guilt, like people like or people like look at something and if it feels like it's a possibility, you don't even want to want to suggest it as a possibility. But, you know, these companies are willing to do that because I think they, pro they probably do make some money from this. But by all accounts, you know, and anyone who reviewed this game didn't use these things because there was no microtransaction store uh, up on Steam at the time that they were playing Correct. that. And there is no store inside the game to purchase these things. Um, and now that sense, you're like, okay, th then there's some criticism of, well, then the reviewers didn't know about these things. And then that we went live after all the reviews. Isn't that a problem? I am very sensitive to that sort of thing. I am very, yes. I'm, at, I'm at my wits end with that sort of thing when it comes to games that add that stuff weeks after their launch in the review period. But yeah. Once again, in Capcom's defense, this stuff was mentioned in the reviewer's guide. Now, I've never read a reviewer's guide in my life, Emma. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like doing that. I'm like, I want to try to have the experience that most people are going to have. And most people are not going to have a curated, curated. Yes. Um, and the, the guide is not like, here's how to beat a boss. Usually the guide is like, here are all the features. Here's what's in the game. Here's yes. what you need to know. It's PR trying to get, get you off on the right foot. But I, I usually don't yep. read that. But that is them doing their due diligence. And that is, so the company did their part of it me not reading it or whoever not reading the re mm -hmm. reviewer's guide at that point that, you know, they did their side. That's on the reviewer, I suppose. Um, so yeah, my, the micro transactions are not bothering me so much. The performance is pretty nuts. How, how, how well, the P the PS three of it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay. On console, yeah, my understanding, I haven't played on console, but the yeah. frame rates uncapped and it just, barely sometimes gets over 30 frames per second. So you're getting like 30 yes. into 40 and then it's jump, jumping back down to 20. It's going all over the place. Yeah. Uh, again, I haven't paid too much atten attention to the console version. On PC, yep. I have a 4090 and I have an i9, I think 13th gen or 14th gen CPU in here. And um, and I do I do think my system is CPU bound when playing the game. And I am, it's like, it will go between 40 to 60 frames per second in a way that I right. think is kind of insane, especially when yeah. I'm, I'm playing. I think I'm trying to get it like to 1080p, maybe 1440p. Uh, it is very unoptimized. So CPU yeah. bound, I, I get that they're trying to, to simulate a lot. And I, I think that's important. I just think that the game came in hot, is undercooked, isn't finished. And that's what we're seeing. That's what it feels like. And if people should be criticizing that because most people are not going to be able actually to enjoy this game on PC, it seems like. No. Yeah. And what a bummer, too, because that character creator is right. robust. And so, <laughs> so you want to do a thing like, I do want to have like three pawns with me at all time, yeah. but it's like that's going to make every situation just that much more difficult. Now, things don't really get out of hand until there are then enemy characters and, and, uh, and NPCs on the screen all, the, uh, all at the same time for me, usually. Uh, yeah, but that is maybe happening more frequently than I would expect, even uh, uh, for for a game that is unoptimized like this. It's like okay, I have my crew of four, and now we have one NPC and like five birds, and it's chugging sometimes. It's like that. I mm -hmm. that feels bad for someone who got who had NZXT send them like a top of the line system, and now I'm like struggling. It's like what the hell are we doing here? But I. I you know, it is the RE engine, Reach for the Moon engine. I, yes. They've not done open world before, and I think they are having some learning curves, which I think happens with most of these engines. So I'm willing yeah. to give this team that's been very good tech-wise a little bit of time to figure it out. Yep. Not much time, though. Get, get it fixed, please. Yeah. Uh, all right, yeah. up next, uh, time for the Sonic news. Sonic Toys Party leaked, basically Sonic Fall Guys. This is from Rhiannon Bevan at The Gamer. Gameplay from a new Sonic game has seemingly leaked online alongside its apparent title, Sonic Toys Party, which sounds 
Kind of naughty. If the gameplay is real, then it <laughs> confirms that previous rumors were right, and the upcoming Sonic game will play an awful lot like Fall Guys. This comes from a leaked Japanese trailer for Sonic Toys Party, which also confirms that it will be a mobile release. In brief gameplay sequences, we see players racing across Sonic-themed obstacle courses, all based on levels from the mainline games. However, unlike Fall Guys, Sonic Toys Party also features enemies from the Sonic series with combat straight out of the 3D platformers. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. um, how do, something like this does sound kind of promising to me. I like the idea of Sonic being like, listen, we tried to put out a 2D Sonic game the same time as Mario. Didn't go great. Didn't go. What, what should we be doing with Sonic? Well, keep doing those games. Try to make them better. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought Sonic Frontiers is fine. Um, do more of that. I bet the next one will be better. Yes, keep making those. But then just look around, see what works, and make Sonic versions of those, and just put actual effort into it. And I think that goes a long way, because the Sonic characters are very appealing. Even I can admit that. So if you want to give me some like ways to, exp like, to go play a game with my kids, where we all get to play as Sonic characters, I will probably show up for that. And I think this is just a fine idea. Well, I don't know. What do you oh, think? Yeah. I mean, it's like, embrace the goofy. Um, and, and that's like what worked so well about... Fall Guys when it launched is there was so much chaos. Like I, re I remember when it first came out and I played it a, a fair amount and I would just get together with some friends. It was 2020 and we would play Fall Guys and I would just laugh. And it, like, and there is this, um, I don't know, there's this level of, as you say, like, I, I think casualness is not the right word for it, but is, but it is that ability to pick up and play with friends, with your kids and, and find yourself in a situation wherein you're just like having a nice time, which is how I felt about the entirety of Super Mario Brothers Wonder. I was like, I'm just having a nice time. Um, and I'd love to see that from Sonic. And I think that this is a good fit for that. And that, you know, Sonic hasn't quite locked into the, we also make Sonic in these kind of games in the way that say Mario has, obviously, you know, you have things like Mario Kart and Mario party, which have been tremendously successful. Um, and I think that, you know, Sonic needs that. And this is a, this is a good formula to play with the Sonic characters within. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good way to use the Sonic aesthetic of not just the characters, but like um, we're looking at the trailer trailer now and the classic look of Genesis Sonic games, uh, where, you know, it's it looks like Green Hill Zone. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah that's a really good fit for this kind of game. It's uh, simple. It's very easy to parse visually. And it's very nostalgic. And I think you hit those things and you, you're halfway towards having something that people are going to have a good time with. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, then the what they're actually doing needs to be fun. We'll see. Yes. Uh, but but as it stands, it's like, I like the way this looks. It's maybe not popping off the screen as much as I could even imagine it could. Um, but, you know, they're probably trying to keep it simple visually for, for mobile devices. Now, that said, hopefully this is not just mobile devices. I think this would be great if it came yeah, to that PC was what and, I was and Switch say. as well. Yeah, yeah, right? Why not on console? Especially if it's free to play, just throw it up on the store. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time with this if it's just on mobile. I don't know. What do you? What, how about you? Yeah, I when it comes to mobile games, uh, I I love I do a, a I'm pretty strictly a single player uh, experience mobile games kind of gal. Sure. Uh, I know that children um, enjoy multiplayer mobile games. Uh, I don't think I have the thumb dexterity for it anymore as an elder millennial. Uh, <laughs> and also the screen's really small. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, to me, I'm like, uh, I, I'm, especially if there's going to be any platforming involved whatsoever, like I need a controller in my hand. Like that's how you, that's how you platform. That would be ideal. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I hope this comes to like switch at the very least PC. That would be great. All the other yeah, consoles, yeah. let's make it happen. Um, we'll see, but a Sonic fall guys game, like, Nintendo did this with like a, a new Mario Party that was basically Fall Guys. I think that would be a great idea as well. Uh, it's a really yeah. good new concept, and I think like Fall Guys uh, occupies a, a kind of a certain space. You could do a lot mm -hmm. of twists on the formula to make it even more kid friendly or whatever, uh, and I think that'd be ideal. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we got a lot more headlines to get back to right after this, including what's going on with Ben Studios, the Zelda movie, and more. All right, moving on here to the next headline. Days Gone Studios' new IP is a live service game. Ben Studios' new IP is a live service game, according to some newly emerged evidence. The Sony subsidiary, Hints, appears poised to join its parents' 
ongoing live service foray, which is bound to put Bend Studio well outside its comfort zone. The Oregon-based company, uh, with the Bend, Oregon, actually, that's what it's mm-hmm. named after. Uh, latest game was Day Go- Days Gone, uh, which reached the PS4 in April 2019 before making its way to PC two years later. Ben Studio subsequently confirmed it's working on a new IP, but the group has yet to share any concrete information about that project. Even so, the company has now offered some indirect hints about the nature of its upcoming title. According to a recently serviced, ben, surfaced Bend Studio job ad reviewed by Game Rant, the developer's new IP is a live service game. The listing, which advertises an ongoing or an, yeah, an opening for a lead project manager, explicitly mentions live service games thrice both in the context of the uh, eventual hire's everyday responsibilities and the ideal candidate's required and preferable experience. Um, yes, we do, we do know Sony was moving in this direction. I think there were some questions about how hard are they going to continue moving in this direction, but I, I would imagine that when Ben Studio was pitching games to get funding within Sony for their next project after Days Gone, uh, and we know that they pitched a couple of things uh, that they did like have like two other ideas that were maybe going to get uh, green, green lighted. They did not. The time that they were pitching was right in that meaty part of the curve where the thing that was most likely to get green lighted was a live service game. And now here we are. Um, uh, you, you know, all, all these studios having to figure out how to do green, uh, uh, how to do uh, 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 live service games was always going to be a challenge. I don't mm-hmm. think it's going to be an especially uh, like, cha- like a specific challenge just for Ben Studio. Like, oh, they're going to have such a hard time with this. I think everybody has a hard time with this transition, yes. <laughs> and and yet I don't, I do not envy them having to figure it out. This is going to be uh, kind of a uh, probably a rough transition for anybody, like we said. But uh, I kind of hard, have a hard time imagining what this looks like. I, I I don't think that they would go with like a gritty, realistic game and yet they said triple a so what does that look like to you um yeah i just uh, i don't know is it look we've got gta online if you want anarchy on (laughs) on the internet uh in a in a triple a kind of setting so i i just yeah, um, again, it's complicated because uh, everybody, when they make that transition to live service game, there is a big learning curve involved. Um, and a lot of the time, the games that are really successful as live service games started off being not successful at all. You look right. at an example like, a, a you know, a Final Fantasy 14, which they completely re-haul- overhauled the entire game, and it just feels like no matter what they do, they'll likely find themselves in a situation like that. Yeah, I. Uh, it's just, um, I don't know, good luck, Ben Studio. Yeah. <laughs> I feel I, for that, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, th- I think you nailed it, where it's, uh, you know, you talk about the, some of the, me- the most experienced developers in the world trying to make yep. a live service game. Even the ones that have made live service games before, like Bungie, they made Destiny and they went through all of those growing pains with Destiny. And it's like, you know, Destiny, a great a game that a lot of people found very fun out of yeah. the jump. But then they're like, they get they get to the ongoing live service game part and it, people might not remember. I think a lot of people will. But at, at that time, it was a lot of like, this is unsubstantial. And where is the new stuff? Because if they want to keep me around, there's, there better be new stuff. And it's taking a long time. And even when the new stuff gets here, it's kind of, who it, it's not really what I was expecting or wanted. It took Bungie a long time to figure it out with Destiny 1. And they learned all those lessons. And then they go to, De- to De- Destiny 2. And there's either a whole new crop of problems or they have a s- very similar problems. Once again, it's just hard to make a live service game. And then we saw everyone like look at Destiny and be like, well, we're going to do one of those. And everyone else made the same exact mistakes because you kind of can't learn by watching. You can only learn how to do a live service game by doing, at least from where I'm sitting, that's what it seems like. And so the expectation would be Ben Studio is going to have to learn those lessons the hard way as well, despite the fact that Sony now owns Bungie and can bring them in to consult. Like, I I think it's very easy to point out something isn't working and why it's not working implementing the solution or the answer is the art of it all and it's Mm -hmm. very challenging to actually do that ahead of time it kind of takes some several iterations so you know all these are not reasons to pursue live service games in these companies opinion and and that's fine they're going to keep making these um and but when it comes to bend i i don't necessarily know that they're like hey we would like you to make days gone too so right is this a better use of your time i i guess i i don't know we're gonna see 
Um, I, I do wonder if we get on the other side of this, though, and and if they were to just make a Days Gone 2 instead, everyone would be like, actually, this is way better. Um, they're gonna, they do have experience making that. They can apply that yes. experience directly to make it a better game. Maybe that would be a better use of their time, especially since uh, it feels like live service games are increasingly... Uh, a riskier bet and more so than they were even just a couple of years ago. Yeah. I mean, especially when you do have the pressure of it being like a triple A level live service game, you know, there's enough yep. pressure on triple A titles as it is. And then you want to also add the, the layer that is live service. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, all right, we got to move on. I'm looking at the yeah, time. There's so much. There's so much left. Legend of Zelda movie director teases awesome idea and says he wants to create something serious and cool, but fun, fun and whimsical. This is from Bradley Russell and Kim Taylor Foster at Games Radar Plus. A live action Legend of Zelda movie is on the way from West Ball, and now the Maze Runner director has outlined his exciting vision for the upcoming Nintendo project. I have this awesome idea, Ball tells Total Film in a, our new issue out on Thursday, March 28th, which features the Fall Guy on the cover. Uh, I've been thinking about it for a long freaking time of how cool Zelda movie would be. I want to fulfill people's greatest desires. I know oh, it's boy. important. This Zelda franchise to people and I want to make, I want it to be a serious movie, a real movie that can give people an escape. Ball even points to that escapism. I want to live in that world, he says, as the driving force behind this, the Legend of Zelda movie. That's the thing I want to try to create. It's got to feel like something real, something serious and cool, but also fun and whimsical. Um, I think that is the right goal. I do. Yes. I think it's going to be an order of magnitude more difficult to achieve that with a live action movie as, to, as opposed to something that is animated. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. What do, what but do you I think? also would just like to point out that literally all this man said is i want to make a good zelda movie yes exactly yes right these, everybody these, wants they, a good zelda movie okay right. like yes. you, you have said nothing about what your actual vision for this film is you basically are saying zelda cool I make cool Zelda movie. Duh, of course, yes. Okay, and, and but Zelda what is, is cool the vision and for this? Right. It, it's yeah. So you're encompassing all the things that Zelda could potentially be. Uh, you're right, and and I think that belies the challenge here, where where you're gonna have to kind of pick a tone. And yeah, you could deviate yeah. from that tone every once in a while, but here it just feels like. I yeah I like it when Link fights Ganon and Ganon is big and scary and that's pretty serious and cool and I yep. like it when Tingle shows up and dances in his underwear that's whimsical and fun and it's like yeah homie we all like all those things yeah. are you going to be able to make that all work uh, there is no indication here that that's the case uh, and again I, I think people are much more skeptical of this because it's live action I think um, if you were saying all this and, and then promising and we're going to animate it, I think that gives you so much more leeway to have fun with it uh, than yeah. having Timothy Chalamet dress up as Zelda or Link oh, and God. then and then uh, and then try no, to go I talk to Tingle. I want Timothy Chalamet to play Zelda. <laughs> yeah, Timothy Chalamet is Zelda. Hell yeah, that would rule. Um, it's like Zendaya is Michi. Zendaya is Michi. Chalamet Timothy is <laughs> Zelda. Perfect. Um, no, I yeah. I, look. I, I, there's a lot of really great Zelda IP to work with. Part of me feels like just, I don't know, make Majora's Mask, make something super freaking weird and just lean into that rather than trying to be like, here are all the things I think are cool about Zelda and we're going to put them in one movie. That is not going to work. I'm just yeah. telling you, that's yeah. not going to work. And the thing, the thing I would really want is like a 10 part animated series based on Link's Awakening because like, there's so many like little these stories you could tell in each episode yeah. that one can lead into the next. I mean, that's what the whole game is. It's just these little quests that lead into a bigger quest. And then that the meta story there of of overall of what's happening, what's really happening to Link, what's really happening in this world would be a nice, fun little reveal for people who aren't familiar with the story. And that could that could work. But it, that's something they maybe do later. I get why that's not going to be the first thing that they're going to try here. They're probably just going to make Ocarina of Time. And that's fine. We'll see. Yeah. Uh Director says Final Fantasy IX references in Final Fantasy XIV. Again, another story that could be like the top story. Uh, the Final Fantasy yes. IX references in Final Fantasy XIV Dawn, Dawn Trail are there as a secret amid remake reports. This is from Jordan Midler at VGC. Final Fantasy XIV director Naoki Yoshida has said that the reason for many references to, to Final Fantasy IX in the upcoming expansion is a secret. You may have noticed a lot of Final Fantasy IX references here. 
The reason is a secret, Yoshida said at PAX East, while announcing several pre-order and digital bonuses for Final Fantasy XIV Dodd Trail the refer uh, that referenced the game. I was um, in, in that room for the panel because my panel was next. And I was kind of off to the side. And when he was saying that, Aww. I'm like, I'm like, homie, I read the NVIDIA leak. We know what's going on here. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. <laughs> in 2021, a Final Fantasy IX remake was one of the many unannounced titles listed in a GeForce Now database leak. These included several Square Enix games that would later be officially confirmed, such as the PC version of Final Fantasy VII Remake, a Chrono Cross remaster, and Kingdom Hearts IV. Yes. While a Final Fantasy IX Remake has yet to be announced, Giant Bomb reporter Jeff Grubb claimed last year, <laughs> I will say I heard very recently, <laughs> once again, Final Fantasy IX Remake is real, that is real, and happening. I forget I say these things, so I'm glad that Jordan's got my back here. <laughs> yeah, did, that's yeah, right, I remember that reminded. now. <laughs> I remember that. Yes. I mean, yeah, again, let's like we know it's real because the NVIDIA leak, but it's just nice to, like at that time to be like, oh yeah, someone yes. told me separately that is happening. It's happening, everybody. And guess oh why? We know for sure now all these references have to do with them making a big deal out of Final mm -hmm. Final Fantasy Nine. So yeah, um not I mean, not surprising, but only because the leak has been so con like confirmed so many times at this yes. point uh, that we know we can trust that NVIDIA uh, uh, database. Um and I'm, I think this is a cool way of doing it. People love Final Fantasy IX, so I, I hope that this oh, is everything that they want. Big time, yeah. I mean, look, I'm I'm all for a Final Fantasy IX remake, and especially um, with Yoshi P's team working on it. Um, look, there were things about uh, Final Fantasy XVI that I didn't necessarily love, mostly that it was, you know, I I really enjoyed Clive as a main character, but I did miss having the kind of emotional connection that you get to the other characters who are in your party because they sure. weren't in your party. And also I think there was some feedback around Final Fantasy VII Remake where they're like, everybody talks to each other too much in battle. And so they basically have them not talk to each other at all in battle in Final Fantasy XVI, where you really, really needed it because you just don't get those kind of incidental interactions with the characters. So I just don't care about them as much. Um, but that being said, I do think that this team does a really nice job with your more like classic fantasy Final Fantasy. And I, I think it'll be really nice for them to take on something like a Final Fantasy IX, which lives very firmly in that Final Fantasy sort of traditionally what we would think of with the word fantasy, but still has the fun uh, that the Final Fantasy 16 is intentionally missing because, again, it's like they made the choice to make it a very serious story and not to say that Final Fantasy 9 is not. But I just think it would be I, I think that the, they would do a great job and I'm excited to play this. Yeah, I, people were in chat are wondering, hey, why are they skipping eight for the remake? And I, I guess that my real question to you, Emma, here is what is your expectation for the scope of a Final Fantasy 9 remake because we're not yeah, i'm not so, this is not going to be any close anywhere yeah, yeah, close yeah. to what final fantasy 7 remake is right oh no no not at all i mean yeah. that's the thing is that i think final fantasy 9 is like pretty nice the way that it is it's still relatively playable um you know obviously we're going to get graphics that are more on par with what we would expect today and i assume that you know there will be certain expansions to it but this is not this is not going to be a final fantasy 7 like Fully re I mean, yes, fully rebuilt from the ground up, but story probably not fully rebuilt from the time up. I don't from the ground up. I don't see uh, multiple universes and converging timelines. And is this character dead or not uh, right. happening in Final Fantasy nine? It's just not that game. No. And, and for me, you know, these games are mostly one big JRPG mush in my brain. And so yeah, I'm trying to yeah. I, I know that Square did that. Was it Children of Mana or the Mana remakes? That, where there's they, a like, lot they, of there's a lot of Mana remakes. Yeah, right, and they, they like did a pretty big overhaul to the visuals and, and made them look like modern games. But that was kind of the big change. Or, or, or I suppose uh, the one I did mess around with a little bit was um, what is the PSP game, the Final Fantasy one, uh, Crisis Core. Oh yeah, yeah, Crisis Core. That, Crisis Core, that where, did get a remaster. That's, a, yeah. that's a, they, you know technically a remake because they swapped out every piece of assets for modern assets, but then underneath yeah. a very similar game, Ex except for the cutscenes, which they kept the cutscenes from right. the PSP version of the game, and now the right. cutscenes look worse than the in-game engine, um, exactly. mostly because the character's skin doesn't have any texture and it's creepy. Right. So, so I, I'm, I'm expecting something along those lines. Uh, maybe, maybe Final Fantasy IX gets the benefit of actually. Uh, new cutscenes, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, honestly, they maybe yeah. they just do in-game cutscenes at that point. That would make sense. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Resident Evil 9 will be open world, leakers suggest. This is from Vicky Blake at Eurogamer. Resident Evil 9 is reportedly being developed as an open world game. That's according to noted leaker Dusk Gollum, who said that following Capcom's improvements to the RE engine when developing open world experiences <laughs> like Dragon's Dogma 2, Capcom is eager to capitalize on the expanded tech when making Monster Hunter Wild and Resident Evil 9. So here's a little tidbit I'll share, Dusk Gollum said on Twitter. Capcom often will greenlight new initiatives in threes closer together. Decent examples are Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 2, and De uh, Devil May Cry 5 were all greenlighted fairly close together to, to take advantage of their new RE engine. And the idea uh, to, uh, to remake RE2 inspired them to also take on RE3 and RE4 for a remake initiative. Dragon's Dogma 2 expanded RE engine functionality for open world games. The two other games building on this tech is Monster Hunter Wild and Resident Evil 9. All three project goals uh, have been to retain the series DNA. Dragon's Dogma 2 is still clearly Dragon's Dogma. Wild is cl still clearly Monster Hunter. Same will be true for Resident Evil 9 uh, with Resident Evil. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think that uh, obviously Monster Hunter going open world is kind of something where they've only, they've been faking that for a very long time. They, like, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. want it to feel like a connected stitch together world. And you're usually going to these open zones. So stitching those all together and making it work that way kind of yes. only makes sense. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Resident Evil 9, that's the one where it's like, oh, the reason you say they're going to try to keep the serious DNA is because people are going to immediately worry, is this going to lose the, the, the DNA of the world? And I think um, that for me, experimenting with a whole new way of doing things with Resident Evil 9, it's probably the right time, right? So they, yeah. you know, they had Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, and then uh, some offshoots, Code Veronica. They change things yep. up with 4. They do 5 and yep. 6. They change, they change things up with 7, 7, 8. Uh, you know, maybe we're kind of having a, a period where it's like two games in one style with, with how long they take to develop. Maybe that makes more sense. And now doing yeah. something different with nine, I think that's probably right. And I believe that they probably can maintain some of the uh, the DNA here with, with Resident Evil oh, 4. Yeah. This game. The big thing for me is in D Dragon's Dogma, monsters will follow you around the open world in a way that yes. they don't. And like uh, Gene Park pointed this out on Twitter. So shout out to Gene where it's yeah, like yeah. Uh, like a big dragon in, uh, in uh, Elden Ring. In yeah. In Elden Ring. They, they, like, stay, they stay in their like their um the, their contained zone. Their area. Yep, they they, they won't correct. ever leave that. And it's like in yep. Resident Evil 9, the idea of like hiding these monsters around or, or having something actually literally chase you across an entire landscape. Uh, that 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 is something that I think Resident Evil has always had in the back since like Resident Evil Three mm -hmm. with Nemesis or you know with uh, Res Resident Evil Two with uh, Mr. X whatever his name is yeah so, stalking you through the PlayStation right so st having them someone stalk you through an open world I think is is there's potential there so I'm hopeful and I and at this point I think we're giving the benefit of doubt to Capcom right yeah I mean at this point they're they're dealing with they're finding the limitations of RE Engine with. Dragon's Dogma 2. Yes, they are. They're uh, pushing so the limitations, can, yes. Yes. So they can come back, swing in with Resident Evil 9. They will know how to do open world at that point. And, you know, I, Resident Evil has got to be up there uh, in terms of their best-selling franchise if it's not their best-selling franchise these days. Uh, you know, I'm I'm hopeful. I, I, I'm in agreement with you. They're like, this this is the right time to experiment. Right. Yes, definitely. Um. All right, last couple things here. Microsoft reportedly reaches agreement with Crash Bandicoot developer Toys for Bob for a new game. This is from Wesley Impool at IGN. And basically the story here is Toys for Bob got, got was able to like get itself out from Microsoft after the acquisition of Activision. Uh, and Toys for Bob is now independent. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're going to immediately make this deal. Uh, now the deal's confirmed with Microsoft to make a game with Microsoft. We don't know exactly what it is, but the reporting here is that it is going to be something very similar to what Toys for Bob does, probably a 3D platformer, and then you can speculate on whatever that's actually going to be. Is it going to be a new Spyro, new Crash? Are they going to work on, on Banjo-Kazooie? Probably not them working on Banjo, because yeah. that was green-lighted a while ago. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I think that there's a, the possibility here that they could be doing any one of those, or maybe something new. Either way, they are on yeah. their own, and this is better than the alternative, I guess, where they would have been shut down and not able to, like, get funding or whatever when they went independent. Yeah. So this is mostly good news, I hope. Yep, I liked the last Crash Bandicoot game. I thought it was very fun. 
Yes. So like uh, Crash Bandicoot 4. Crash Bandicoot 4 is yeah. the best Crash Bandicoot in my, in my so opinion. So fun. Definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then Final Fantasy 6. And I said Banjo it was, was green light. That's the rumor out there. I'm not. It's not like new confirmation, everybody. Please don't go post that headline everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Grubb said. Uh, I'm just, I'm seeing a flash before my very eyes. I'm uh, got to fix what I said here. Uh, all right. Finally, Final Fantasy 16's final <laughs> DLC gets a release date. This is from Willow Row at Kotaku. The last major piece of content for 2023's Final Fantasy 16 now has a release date. The Rising Tide, the second of two planned post-release DLCs, is coming to PlayStation 5 on April 18th. It will cost $20. You get it as part of the uh, $25 expansion pass, though. That includes the Rising Tide mm. and the first DLC, Echoes of the Fallen. Uh, Fallen. Are you checking out this DLC, Emma? Well, I get all of it with the version of uh, Final Fantasy 16 that I was kindly gifted by Square Enix. So, uh, yeah, I'll check it out. Listen, at that point, I think I'll have uh, stomped every fool in the land in Queen's Blood. Uh, I will have conquered every single Chocobo race. So I'll be, you know, I'll be looking for some more Final Fantasy and I'll swing right on back to 16, which, again, liked overall. All right, uh, that's going to take us to the poll question for today. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Uh, I, th I guess this is the last one I asked. Uh, at this point, I don't remember. Do you have a PSVR 2? Uh, no, I don't want one. Said it was 83%. 9% uh, says no, I, but I plan to buy one. And 8% said yes. Um, or was it? Oh, actually, the, the last one is here. It doesn't, this is not actually, we didn't make this a poll. So we messed this up. Do you ever buy the physical <laughs> release of a game that comes out much later than the initial digital only release um. like Baldur's Gate 3? There we go. Now the poll's popping up for me. Uh, 34% said yes, 66% said no. That's actually, again, a pretty big number of respondents saying, yes, I will buy the physical version of a game I liked and played digitally first. Um, or I, I suppose in that number, there could be a lot of people like, I won't play a game until it comes out physical and then I'll buy it then, especially if people are, are, are praising it like something like a Baldur's Gate 3. Um, how, how about you? Like when uh, Baldur's Gate 3 came out, you're we like, hey, if this ever comes out physical, I get it. And now that collector's edition is coming. Are, are you going to pick that up? You know, I um, haven't purchased physical games uh, in quite some time. Same. I like the instant gratification of being able to just download it. However, yeah. uh, I also am aware that all of my friends who are snobs about physical media, they might be justified uh, the way that some oh, of yeah. it. Now, it's not happening so much with games, but certainly with streaming services and people losing their licensing agreements. So then you lose access to content that you had previously purchased. Yep. I'm still probably not going to do it, but I understand is yeah, what I'm saying. I get that I'm part of the problem. I'll say that. Much. Yes. I know I'm part of the yes. problem. I'm not going to change, but I know I'm part yeah, of the no, problem. Absolutely not. Uh, the new poll question. We're going to get that up here in a second. Before we do that, Emma, why don't you tell people where they can find you on the internet, what you have going on and all that good stuff. Yeah, so you can find me on the internet at my name, Emma Fife, on Twitter, on Instagram. I don't really use social media very much these days, uh, but I'm still there. Um, you know, find me, find me in the Giant Bomb Discord server. I'm also yeah. Emma Fife in there. So if you if you got burning questions for me, you can just tag me right in there. Uh, yeah, and then um, yeah, that's. That's me. I got lots of stuff happening. So, you know, just what, check out Giant Bomb. Check out GameSpot. I'm I'm around. I'm doing stuff. Uh, fantastic. Uh, every, and you'll be back here next Monday, probably, if we can make yes, it happen. I will. So, fantastic. Yes. <laughs> All right. New poll question. This will go up on YouTube.com slash at Giant Bomb under the community tab there. You can find, are you okay that Larian Studios next game isn't going to be Baldur's Gate? Yes or no? Uh, and listen, if you're disappointed, you want more Baldur's Gate from Larian Studios, you're allowed to feel that way. You could say no. Uh, we'll discuss the results of this poll on Game Mess Mornings on Giant Bomb on Wednesday when we come back with a new episode. On Tuesday, we will have the Bombcast. Be sure to tune in for that, everybody. Um, there's going to be more happening this week. I'll probably play Dragon's Dogma 2 on the website at some point. Maybe later today. Depends on how things go with uh, with taking the kid to, to her therapy session. And then when I get back, we'll see how we'll see if we make that happen. And then for the rest of the week, expect stuff like Blight Club back on Wednesday, uh, voicemail dump truck on Thursday, UPF. Maybe there'll be a Jeff Jeffs. I don't know. We're going to go to the meeting right now and figure it out, actually, everybody. <laughs> Emma, thank you so much for spending today talking with me about video games. I really appreciate it. Of course. And thank you all for watching and listening. You're the best audience in gaming. Until next time, have a good one. 
take care of yourself and goodbye.